Welcome to the official podcast of the Chalcedon Foundation, a think tank for the self-governing Christian. In a time when Christians are looking for answers in revival, rapture, or the religious right, Chalcedon presents a comprehensive biblical worldview that calls believers to their covenant responsibilities in order to advance Christ's kingdom in every area of life. Thanks for joining us for this 12th episode of the Chalcedon Podcast. Today is March 7th, 2021, and I'm Andrea Schwartz, joined once again by Chalcedon President Mark Rushduni and Chalcedon Vice President Martin Salbretti. Now, the church over the centuries has been told that its members are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And that sounds good to a lot of people, but I'm not sure they really understand what that means. And that's what we're going to explore as we have our conversation this evening. So, Martin, what's your take on how the church has done representing Jesus Christ as ambassadors? I think by and large, the last 150 years have shown that rather than running an embassy, we've been running a bus stop for the rapture. And it's not entirely at all what Paul had in mind when he declared that he is an ambassador for Christ, that there is, in fact, an embassy and that we're envoys uh, and have a message specifically to provide to the world. The passage in 2 Corinthians 5 that deals with Paul's claim that we're ambassadors begins with the word, therefore, it's verse 20, therefore. Well, what happened before that he would say, therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ? It's the fact that he's talking about the ministry of reconciliation, to it that God is reconciling the world to himself. But that's not the message when you're running a bus stop to the rapture, you see. So, yeah, we've done a terrible job. We've not seen ourselves as ambassadors. I think there's even a worse element to that, and we'll probably get into this a little later, because the difference between a good ambassador or envoy and a wicked or poor one is laid out in Proverbs. It turns out that we don't have to guess about the nature of being an ambassador and how you stand with God. Even Paul was concerned about this in Ephesians when he talks about being, in fact, an ambassador in chains. He asked them to pray that he might be able to speak the words that he ought to speak. He was concerned about getting the right words out. We don't, by and large. In fact, we're not speaking the words we ought to speak at all. But we can change that. And there's some good news there as we get into the Proverbs. We'll see that you can actually reverse course because when you're a poor ambassador, disaster and ruin come. And Proverbs will lay this out. We'll get into it. But when you start to become a faithful ambassador, then even the damage can be undone. And we can prove that also from Proverbs. So this doctrine of the ambassador or the envoy of God is not just something that Paul invented on the fly with the Corinthians and then visited uh, again in Ephesians 6.20. But in actual fact, it goes way back in Scripture. In fact, ambassadors have been around at least till Joshua 9, when the Gibeonites pretended to be ambassadors coming a long distance. So we have a doctrine of embassy, ambassador, extraterritoriality, which we'll get into. The notion that an embassy is actually a piece of ground in the middle of your nation that belongs to another nation or another sovereign or another power. And the church needs to see itself as exactly that, as representing another power in the midst of this world, and that it is pressed with advancing the crown rights of the king that we represent for the good and the healing of the nation in which we find ourselves. So, Mark, oftentimes people have this idea, we would call it easy believism, they quote-unquote accept Jesus into their hearts, and boom, they're ambassadors. But ambassador has to know the language, has to know the customs, has to understand those people he or she are going to represent. So speak a little bit about why and how the law of God is vital for an ambassador of Christ to understand. Right. An ambassador does not represent himself or his own opinions. An ambassador represents the kingdom and the administration that dispatches him. So uh, there have been many cases in American history and elsewhere where ambassadors have resigned because they did not feel in good conscience they could pursue a particular policy. And so they have, rather than not do their job as they ought and as they were dispatched to do, they've merely resigned and returned home. So an ambassador has to represent uh, 
the interests that send him, the kingdom that sends him. And therefore, what ambassadors do is considered to be very, very serious. If you recall from your history, there were ambassadors from Japan in Washington at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, they claimed they did not know anything about it, but that was considered a very serious thing, as though they were there for a ruse, and they perhaps were used, I don't know, uh, by their government, but they are, in effect, the government in a foreign country. They represent the government, and they are treated as members of the government, and therefore they're given privileges that they would have if they were still at home in their home kingdom. So... Uh, an ambassador and an embassy has rights too. We've also had instances in ver recent years, it happens periodically, where someone who normally has diplomatic immunity because they're here on diplomatic purposes uh, commits a crime or is accused of committing a crime, and they're often hurried out of the country because of the scandal involved, because they actually cannot be prosecuted while they're an ambassador and while they're representing another country. So they, there are real privileges involved in being an ambassador. And we have privileges to represent the kingdom of our Lord, but we also have the responsibility to know what our Lord demands of us, know what we should be representing as his word and his position. So we have to speak in terms of the kingdom of God Wherever we are, even if it seems we're on foreign ground, we have to speak that word and not our own. Well, isn't by nature of the fact that as ambassadors, we're almost always on foreign ground unless we're worshiping with the church and we're in with other members of the body of Christ, we end up being on foreign ground if we are in an area where God's law isn't respected and the civil governments don't recognize it. Absolutely. That's our calling, to be ambassadors, to be representatives of that kingdom. Therefore, we have to be well-versed in what is expected of us and how we represent that kingdom on foreign soil. I'd like to add to that, that uh, when we said that 2 Corinthians 5.20, the verse where he declares us to be ambassadors himself and those who follow in his footsteps, uh, begins with the word, therefore, that therefore not only walks back to the preceding doctrine of the reconciliation of the world to God through Christ, but two other things that I think are important that we miss out. If we're going to be a faithful ambassador, then we have to take the whole package. We have to look exactly at the context of Paul's claim and what therefore is the laundry list of things that the ambassador is responsible for, rather than taking a, making a very teeny minimized, uh, easy um, ambassador light situation, he actually throws three things in there. There's the doctrine of the reconciliation of all things to Christ. And then there is two more things I think that are fascinating. He says, one, all things are of God in the context, just a couple of verses before that. We know that all things are of God. That means every single topic, every discipline, every thought, every area of life is of God. In other words, it is not neutral. It is not secular. It's godly. The Bible speaks to it. We have a Christian worldview in reference to it. So we have to be pressing God's crown rights for all things, that Christ has the preeminence in all things. Then he adds this. He says, I know no man after the flesh. From henceforth, I know no man after the flesh anymore. In other words, I don't relate to anyone humanistically. Even as an ambassador, he relates to them as a fellow image bearers of God in a biblical sense. So even his relationships are now governed. So as an ambassador, we have to be faithful to at least these three things. And I think there's more. But at least these three things in the context of 2 Corinthians 5.20, the run up to it, because he puts these things together, right? All things are of God. I know no man after the flesh. God is in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself. Uh, and we are ministers of that reconciliation. And therefore, I am an ambassador. So he's putting all these things together as a package deal. So we cannot rewrite our orders and say we don't need any of this stuff about taking biblical uh, dominion and cognizance of all things or having a biblical worldview. On the contrary, that's part of being an ambassador. The embassy is there not to be a symbol of withdrawal from culture, but of influence in the culture, of advancing a beachhead, an outpost. And so that means every home school, every Christian school, every bank that's premised on full reserve banking that's based biblically, 
all these steps are various forms of an embassy because they represent Christ, they represent God, they represent biblical thinking, and therefore they serve our Lord in an, in, as an envoy of his truth, of his message. So the envoy has to be certain and has to believe the message. So do we have to restrict this, Mark, to people who already agree with us? You know, you hear Christians saying we need to build a bridge of understanding. Is part of the duty of the ambassador to proclaim the truth in such a way as to show the authority behind his or her words? Well, there's a lot of things in Scripture that makes us uncomfortable. There's a lot of things, therefore, that we must proclaim as the word of God, even if we're not comfortable with them. We would not write the law of God as it is written for us. We would be a lot gentler in areas that were sensitive to us. Therefore, but an ambassador has to represent that kingdom that sends him, and he has to do that faithfully. He cannot maneuver and say it would be an easier message if I lessened this policy. And quite frankly, a lot of diplomatic policies are very hard-nosed, uh, so hard-nosed that they sometimes lead to war. Many ambassadors have not wanted to see war, therefore they've resigned rather than do it. We don't have the option of resigning. We're either faithful ambassadors or we're unfaithful ambassadors. And so, yeah, we have to proclaim the truth, even when it is hard to proclaim the truth, even when that truth makes us uncomfortable. So one of the things that's happened in recent months is this idea that the state tells the church whether or not it can meet. And there have been many people who have backed off from asserting the crown rights of Jesus Christ because of a misunderstanding that in order to be effective, you have to be nice or conciliatory. So Martin, speak a little bit about how too often ambassadors misrepresent and what effect that has in terms of speaking to the general culture. Sounds like we're going to actually confront that passage in Proverbs, which I think does speak to the question, the difference between a good and a bad ambassador, a good or a bad messenger, good or a bad envoy. The word messenger is a little different in Hebrew, malak. We get the word Malachi, for example. The word for the envoy, the ambassador, is cheer. And so this, these contrast is in Proverbs 13, 17. In the King James, we read, A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. If you look at Bruce Waltke's massive commentary on Proverbs, he says it contrasts the character of the wicked messenger and his misfortune with those of the conscientious envoy and the healing he brings to the communities. That's the difference, see? Uh, so here we have this difference between the two. And he translates that last clause, but a faithful ambassador is one who brings healing. You see, if you're an unfaithful ambassador, you're not going to bring healing to the community. You can't because it's a premise. In fact, as he says, uh, because the Lord upholds a moral order, the wicked messenger perishes or plunges himself into ruin through evil. And because he deals with the commands in a evil and selfish way and creates confusion and tension between the client, God, and the audience is flock, and he falls himself into the evil that he has created. You see, so when you're bad, if you're misrepresenting as God's mouthpiece what God wants to have happen, then you bring ruin upon yourself and the people. Now I said earlier that there's a, a bright side to this, and that is, as Welke says, the faithful or trustworthy envoy is one who brings healing, as a therapeutic agent. He says he refreshes his client, that is the Lord God, by giving him good news. Uh, that his message is faithfully proclaimed and contributes to the healing of a sick community. And then he says this about this verse, because remember this verse says, here's the wicked guy, here's the good guy. The sequence of clauses suggests that the conscientious envoy, the conscientious ambassador, can even remedy the havoc wrought by the wicked one. And I think that's where we find ourselves today. We need to be the conscientious envoy so that we can undo the havoc of a bad message. Now, when you talk about the specific case of churches that are, have, are at war, if you will, with the civil government saying you may not uh, assemble together, the saints can no longer assemble together because we say no. What the state is finding itself in is that it's getting crosswise with God himself. And I think the Artaxerxes in Ezra 7 was the wiser ruler in this respect. Uh, the principle of today's tax exemption for churches actually rests on, Exodus, on Ezra 
7, verses 23, 24. And I think it's worth looking at these passages real quick because the mind of Artaxerxes should really be the mind of our civil magistrates today. It isn't, but it's to the hurt of today's uh, civil magistrates. Grab that passage. Whatsoever is commanded, this is Artaxerxes telling uh, his people, is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Then he says, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them, upon the priests, Levites, singers, porters, Nethanim, etc., of the house of God. He says, why should there be wrath upon me and my sons, the princes, uh, simply because we're going to get make God angry? Now, today, modern governors in the United States of America don't care about God or making him angry. In fact, I think someone just made a comment, it was Mr. Nadler in one of the houses of Congress, that the fact we don't care what God's will is about this. We're going to do what we want to do. So when you do this, then you're going to run exactly into the problem that Artaxerxes is avoiding when he's working with Ezra and the God of Ezra. He's saying, why should there be wrath upon us? And we're talking about divine wrath. God will therefore destroy and plunge into ruin again those who are opposed to his will and his demands upon us because it's a moral situation here that we're facing. And that's because the church really has lost sight of the fact that it is an embassy and therefore is extraterritorial. It is a piece of holy soil, soil if you will, in the midst of the secular nation. But it itself is not a secular thing. It is something, an intruded power in there. Uh, it tries to work as best as it can as a healing influence. And if you put it aside or try to shunt it, one, it'll definitely resort to every resource it has to uphold the dignity of Christ and the rights of God's people. But it'll also do that for the benefit of the civil government. By pushing back against the civil government, it's actually the civil government's benefit that it pushed back. Uh, because there will be wrath from God if the civil government decides we're going to mess around with the church. I mean, we don't have to look at what happened when the Ark of the Covenant shows up in a Philistine temple where Dagon's statue is there and poof, falls down each time. And finally, that's what happens when you try to contain uh, the word of the people of God in a way that is not countenanced. God is jealous for his people and for his cause. And ultimately, there is a consequence to pay. It's not one inflicted by the Christians per se but by God himself directly. And I think that is a risk that Artaxerxes was too wise and intelligent to avoid, and that modern politicians are too foolish to realize that they have, what? The wrath of God hanging over their head. See this, uh, the rod in him who appointed it, it says in Micah 6. It's coming, and you better pay attention to it. And it's the rod of God himself. You have to well, do what somebody, you have to do. Right, somebody had to have, warned Artaxerxes or preached to Artaxerxes for him to come to that conclusion. Yeah. And so today, when you don't see the fear of God in civil rulers, could it be that the people of God have tried to um, bring about godly ends by means other than preaching the full counsel of God? Well, if you use the arm of flesh, you have a problem. It's already laid out in Jeremiah 17, 5. Cursed is the man who trusts in man who makes flesh his arm. It's just a curse attached to this. Trust in princes is also a mistake. That's laid out also very clearly in scripture. And every time the church trusts in princes, it learns anew this lesson to its own hurt. And so, yes, that's correct. Whenever we have this mix of the church and the state, it's always the church that tends to hurt and suffer from this mixture because the state promotes a false god. And so we have this form of syncretism. And, and that gets us in trouble all the time. It's a prevailing issue since the church was founded of trying to mix other things in with it, either initially with Judaic uh, notions and uh, then Aryan notions and every other possible notion because people want to ride the coattails of the living God, but do it their way. And so that willfulness, that autonomy is a bad mix. It's a mire of clay and, uh, and, and steel, and it doesn't last. It's not going to work but it doesn't prevent people from doing it. And it doesn't prevent pastors from selling out. Like I said earlier, the embassy is not supposed to be a bus stop and it certainly isn't supposed to be yielding ground to the area that it's supposed to be healing. Uh, healing in terms of the spiritual needs and the need for moral guidance. We go to the church for what does God require of this thing? We, and in old Israel, that's what the purpose was. And even whole areas of biblical law was related to mercy, like the cities of refuge, which were themselves a form of extraterritoriality, an area inside Israel where a different rule applied, where someone was beyond the reach of punitive um, vengeance, if you will. 
of that, of kinsmen, uh, people taking vengeance over, say, a manslaughter case. So there's all sorts of things that are usually forgotten. And usually it's because in the modern parlance, we live and breathe statism, and we kind of want to be buddy-buddy, and we see everything in, in status categories. And until Christians really learn how to think this through biblically and realize that there's but one foundation, and it's Christ, it's not the state, then everything else will fall into place. And the state will even fall into place in its proper uh, um, authority and its place, its sphere sovereignty, if you will. But until that time, we're going to be giving away points, and the people of God will suffer from it, and the cause of God will suffer for it, and God will replace bad envoys and ambassadors with good ones. In the meantime, those who follow them are led into the ditch with the blind guide. Mark? Well, I just want to play off of something that uh, Martin had mentioned there, and that's about the issue of taxes by the church and uh, freedom from taxation of the church. Tax exemption by the church is something that I'll see even Christians mention, uh, is this something that should even be? Shouldn't Christians be paying their fair share of taxes? And they have no concept of where that idea came from. This is not a grant by the IRS. It predates that. It's not a grant even by the U.S. It was recognized in U.S. and American law as something that predates American settlement by a long shot. And it goes back to the, the Old Testament as in Ezra, as, as Martin said. It was something that the church worked for because if we believe in the kingdom of God and that we really do represent a king and his kingdom, and that kingdom really has a, a substantial look to it and substantial responsibilities, and that we have citizenship responsibilities, then as ambassadors of Christ, the church, the assembly, the congregation of, has certain immunities, much like a modern embassy has immunities. If you go to the Russian or the Chinese embassy in Washington, D.C., they're not under U.S. law. They're under the laws of their own nation. And that's why periodically things that go on there are a little bit questioned. Why? Because the U.S. authorities and law enforcement can't walk into those embassies and say, we heard that there was a crime that was committed here. They are, in effect, the territory, extraterritorial, uh, but they're ex the territory of the foreign government as long as it's an embassy. And so if the church is the assembly, the people of God, then its property is sacrosanct. Its property is set aside, and it's under the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God and only the kingdom of God. What is, as far as meeting, what is the church? It's the assembly, the congregation. Therefore, meeting is what the church does. And it's essential to the church, and it's essential to the work of the kingdom. So for the state to step in and say, for any reason, we shouldn't meet. Now, there have been times when Obviously, churches haven't met, never for a year at a time that I know of, but we have to understand that the church has certain inherent rights. The church assumed the sacrosanct position that the temple had, and church property came in Western law to recognize that distinction. There were a few times in ancient history where the temple was violated by civil rulers. Uh, one of the last times certainly was uh, just after the death of Herod the Great, and there was an attempt to put a Roman insignia in the temple, and hundreds of Jews died, some of them in the temple itself, and a couple of the priests of the temple were killed as well. And it was a terrible scandal. That's one of the reasons why we see in the nativity story, one of the last things in the nativity story before they went to Bethlehem was that they were afraid to return from Egypt when they heard that Archelaus was made king because he was so brutal. And this reign of terror and this murder, murderous reign in the temple actually occurred during his tenure. So we have to recognize that the church has rights because it is, represents the kingdom of God. And we don't just yield to it. When 
embassies have been besieged at times. Political embassies have been besieged. The first thing they have to do is destroy their correspondence. They have to destroy as much as possible because this is privileged information. And if the grounds are being besieged and the grounds are going to be taken over, they have to seek to destroy that. So it's a serious thing to violate the rights of the church. So we have this the- idea of sanctuary. So when people, the church would provide sanctuary for people, and that's been an appropriated term that says that any place can be a sanctuary. So we have sanctuary cities. How does that play into this concept? That was dealt with in biblical law. I'm a little vague on the sanctuary, but the sanctuary was considered uh, a, a represented a kingdom and there was a, a privilege given to the sanction, the church to to harbor uh the accused because it was foreign territory right it was kingdom I guess of that our was Lord. my point yeah it was the kingdom of the lord and uh, of course the nations that would at least honor that sanctuary recognized that the people would not tolerate them uh, making that claim that uh, that the church was not a uh, extraterritorial in other words, that that there would be a, a declaration by invading the church that God wasn't there, and or that if He was, they didn't care, and they're going to step on God's face. So there were there's a price to pay to violate the sanctuary. You have to actually set up for decades and centuries, if you will, uh, undermining the faith of a people to the point where sanctuary becomes a meaningless, empty concept. I wanted to roll back around to something that Mark was saying: when you close a nation's embassy and eject the ambassadors. That portends coming war. In other words, there are no more cordial relations, diplomatic relations between the two domains, in this case, between the kingdom of God and this particular kingdom of man, because the kingdom of man has decided to step uh, and uh, threaten and go beyond the threshold of the kingdom of God at this point and claim dominion over it, claim authority over God himself. And so this is a, a dangerous act on the part of the state every time it does it. And it's even a dangerous act in respect to uh, the lockdowns that have occurred and the fact that the churches have been called to uh, essentially vacate their embassies. Everyone out of the embassy, no one's allowed in your embassy anymore. It is, uh, and will penalize you if you are. Well, we can see that this didn't play well disrespecting uh, the ambassadors in the Old Testament, right? In 2 Samuel 10, verses 1 to 14, what did the, uh, the Ammonites do? They decided to go ahead and shave one half of the beard of uh, the embassy amb- ambassadors that David had sent and c- cut their clothes down to the buttocks. And this was considered an act of war, as Rush Tooney points out, when he talks about extraterritoriality in the book Christianity the State, which deals with this topic uh, for several pages. And it's a topic that he acknowledges is generally neglected today to our harm. So it's important to realize that when we say the church is an embassy, there are implications for that, implications that relate to the political domain uh, and the cultural domain, but primarily with respect to God himself. Because the question is, if it is an embassy of God, how are we doing in handling the embassy which has been put in our charge? Are we doing the things that God has required of us as ambassadors? If we're doing everything that God requires as best we can, then the results are going to be in God's hands. But if we're faithless, then the ruin that ha- comes upon us, Scripture is very clear, it is on our own hands that we have mishandled the things of God. And, and when you do that, what happens? God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. So that's the price we pay for being poor ambassadors. I'm going to right. get into this detail again because I want to, as we develop this, circle back around to that passage in Second Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, that precedes the claim that we are ambassadors, because Rush Dunia had some very profound things to say about that in respect to responsibility on our part with respect to the world. Now, in Deuteronomy 11, we're told that every place whereon the soles of your feet tread shall be ours. And of course, that's in Jesus' name, and it's very much tied into the Great Commission. So if you look at it, the domain of the embassy should expand to the point that the surrounding culture falls into line with God's requirements on the culture. But it's not done by an in-your-face kind of interaction. 
it's done by, I think what you were referencing, Martin, this idea that we're trying to reconcile the world to Christ that or point out that Calvary did that. And so I think there's a balance between those who don't want to be confrontational and those who do and not and forgetting the fact that the central aspect is the gospel of Jesus Christ and it's around that rock that we build the foundation of being um, effective ambassadors. What precedes the uh, call to becoming an ambassador, as Paul sees it, is that something sacred has been deposited with him. The ministry of reconciliation has been deposited with him. And this is the charter for his uh, ambassadorship. It is the thing in which, in terms of which his ambassador moves, is energized, and acts. Acts always with the interests of the kingdom of God. But this particular aspect, it was the reconciling of the world to Christ. I'd like to um, appeal to what Warfield's brief discussion of that passage here. It's in uh, the Gospel in the Second Coming, in the shorter writings, just briefly. It says, as this is wont, Paul puts the whole matter into a nutshell. What has been given us who are charged with the preaching of the gospel is, he tells us, distinctively the ministry of reconciliation. And it is the ministry of reconciliation for the specific reason that God was reconciling the world with himself in Christ. It's verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 5. Every word here must be taken in its full meaning. You know, most scholars don't. They just breeze through it without paying attention. Full meaning, the ministry which Paul exercised and which everyone who follows him in proclaiming the gospel exercises with him is distinctively the ministry of reconciliation, not of testimony merely, but of reconciliation. It has as its object and is itself the proper means of the actual reconciliation of the whole world. When Rushton, he talks about this verse in his upcoming commentary on Corinthians, he puts it this way, we are not satisfied with the world as it is. We work to reconcile it to God in Christ. So that's the mission. And so any uh, ambassadorial prerogatives that are just arbitrary, that are uh, have nothing to do with either all things uh, uh, belonging to Christ or in Christ are of, are of God. And I don't know the man, any man after the flesh anymore, plus this doctrine of the ministry of reconciliation. If one of those three aren't in it, then I think we are majoring in the minors and potentially not doing what God's will is because there's a reason why the ambassadorship exists. And he says, because of these three previous things, the ministry of reconciliation, which he says is deposited with us, entrusted to us. How are we doing on that trust that was given to us? How well are we making the reconciliation of the whole world our mission? And the fact of the matter is, most people are, don't want to create the embassy that, that expands, as you say, Andrea, so that the whole world becomes all church, if you will. Uh, over time, over God's working the by pouring his spirit upon all flesh, but rather they're more interested in other provincial things. They narrow the scope of the gospel, or they say, it's not an embassy we're building, it's a bus stop where the bus for the rapture stops, and we're selling bus tickets to that. That's all that we're interested in. Well, that is poor embassy uh, action. It's not an embassy anymore when you do that. And if you once you restrict the mission of the embassy, it's small wonder when you've given away the main task and thrown that away, that you're going to comply with everything the state tells you to do, because you've already compromised on the most important things. Right. So, Mark, um, your father talks about the church being the faith center of a community, and that that's where people will learn how to be ambassadors. And this ties in with Christian education, because for the last, I don't know, 100 years, have people thought that the state would be a good place to have their children learn to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, only to discover that they've become ambassadors for a humanistic statism, and in many cases don't even have a concept of what it means to represent Jesus? Well, I think in recent months, people become increasingly aware of the problems of public education. It's been a process that's been going on for years when my father first wrote about education, it was considered something of a bizarre position because American schools were an Ameri they were a patriotic institution. It was like uh, criticizing mom and apple pie to criticize the public school system. And he received a huge amount of pushback on his calls for Christian education and the, its importance. Today, the reaction to his books, Intellectual Schizophrenia and um, the Messianic Character of American Education, would be far different. 
because so much of that has has become obvious. But yet we can't uh, have our, our children trained by the world and become ambassadors of humanism in our own homes and then expect to somehow further the kingdom. So I think years ago I was at a student conference and a student asked me about what I thought about the, the state of the, the church in general in history. And I think that the church in my lifetime in the 20th century has been in a low ebb and it's it, it, centuries hence we'll look back at our time and see the church was definitely at, at a low ebb. But going back to the idea of ambassadors, particularly, I don't know what it was, has been throughout history, but today to be an ambassador is considered to be a privileged position. First of all, it'd be, it's great to get become an ambassador to a place where you're on a country where it's largely a friendly relationship. A country that's a small country, a beautiful country. It could, for some ambassadors, it's almost like a vac paid vacation. And so it's, uh, you see a lot of political cronies being named as ambassador to this place or that place. Uh, that's not a particularly important country. So it's, it's a privilege, a reward to be named as an ambassador. And usually that does not involve issues of war or conflict. Those are relatively rare. So we have to, uh, to recognize that the privilege which we have to represent our Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been, it's been suggested that, uh, you know, when you talk about the kingdom and uh, an optimistic view of the future, that this just hasn't been panning out that way. The church hasn't been, really been growing, but when you compare it to what the church was when the apostles first started, it's remarkable. When I was in high school, I think uh, I was told that, uh, most of the people who have ever lived in history had lived since, I believe it was 1800. And there's been a lot of population growth uh, over the last 40 years or more. So in the big picture, it's not the ambassador who is responsible for a whole lot. He's just the messenger. All we have to do is be the messenger for the king, a messenger of the kingdom. But most ambassadors are very forgettable individuals. And we are forgettable in the long run, but the kingdom grows and it's not because of us, it's only because we are faithful to the message of the kingdom. We just transmit it. So it's a privileged that we position that we have. It's an honor and it's one we need to take seriously, but ultimately we're not responsible for the message. Uh, we just have to be faithful to it. And of course, that faithfulness might carry a high price. Mark and I both know well the story of the church that was padlocked in Nebraska when Pastor Everett Sullivan went ahead and defied the orders of the state to shut down the Christian school that he was operating on the principle, in his view, that this was an embassy for Christ, an outpost, and it was exempt from the state's authority. Now, the state's pretext, as we all know, was we were interested in quality of education. But when it came time to look at the state administered test scores for the students, that the defense for the church wanted to bring in the table, the uh, offense, the prosecution moved to have all that struck because they weren't really interested in the quality of the education at all. They wanted control over the education. But the point here is that we have an ambassador in chains. And not only was it that when Sullivan uh, ended up uh, in jail, they had a whole string of other elders ready to take the same slot and be equally arrested. And as soon as one was arrested, the next one would be prepared for the chains that the state would throw on him. But this whole thing imploded on the civil government because again, as Ezra 7, 23 says, why should there be wrath upon the king and upon his realm, on his sons? And there was wrath from God in many respects upon Nebraska for what they were doing. So sometimes you do find yourself in Paul's position of being an ambassador in chains. And that literally happened to this particular pastor. And uh, it's a story that's worth telling. Mark, do you have some insights on that that perhaps you picked up from your father in the course of that uh, whole debacle? Well, he was involved in a lot of uh, court trials and such, and it became very interesting. And he made it clear, as you implied, that the, the issue regarding, and a lot of them were about Christian schools, uh, 
which the church, which the state said had nothing to do with the, the church's business. It had a very truncated view of the of the role of the church and the privileges of the of the church. But he said it wasn't a matter of the quality of education. Often, the judge would rule that the quality of the education, the test results, were irrelevant. It was a matter of jurisdiction. And those attempts by the state then, as attempts by the state now against churches, are all about jurisdiction. They're testing how far they can go. And you mentioned Sullivan. That was 30, 40 years ago. Right now, there's a Canadian pastor in jail, and he's going to be there for some weeks until he gets a, a, a trial or a hearing or a trial for meeting, for assembling together on the Lord's Day in the church. Uh, so this is an issue that's coming to it ahead, ahead, the authority of the state versus the authority of the church. And it's going to get interesting. Uh, my dad always said these are interesting times in which we live. And he said things are coming to a head. We're getting to the end of the age of statism, and they're going to get more vicious as they see their authority crumbling. And their authority is crumbling in many ways, and their failures are becoming more and more apparent. And therefore, they are desperate to cling to power in every way they can. And I can tell you that in San Jose, there's a church that meets. We would never have considered this church to be reformed or reconstructionist. But what I'm seeing, because this is a church that has millions of dollars worth of fines, they've been told you can't open up. Their pastors are being um, having fines accrued. They go to court. And apparently at one of the last visits to court, the pastor spoke for an hour and basically said that the church has to minister to people. That's why we're there. And he said that I'm not allowed to close the doors. I'm not disobeying you. I'm obeying God. And his lawyer told him he had never been in a courtroom where the judge let the person speak for an hour without interruption. And every Sunday when he's preaching now, he looks right into the camera because they're still live streaming it. And he knows that the county officials are watching and he lets them know that we're praying for them and that they need to repent of what they're doing. So I see there's a boldness coming out with people who might not have ever found themselves saying these things, but tough times make for tougher people. And when people are forced to exercise courage, their courage grows. So I think it's actually very hopeful. You're right, Mark, it could get ugly in certain situations, but at this particular church, easily a thousand people show up every Sunday and they're coming from all over. Some are coming from 50 and 60 miles away because, and, and why are they coming? They're coming because they saw a negative newspaper or media report about this awful church. And they're saying, oh, that's where I want to be. And so, like you said, it often backfires on the enemies of God. We can look at other examples similar to this, where we have a, an impetus to do what God requires, regardless of the cost. I am reminded that when uh, Michael McVicker was re doing research for his book on Christian Reconstruction and on R.J. Rushdoony, uh, he had written an article about From Owyhee to the World, appeared in uh, November of 2008 in Faith for All of Life magazine. I saw the original draft of this before uh, McVicker submitted the final. The original draft is actually more interesting because it talked about the fact that uh, where Dr. Rushdoony says in his diaries, his diary or, or a letter to someone, uh, the world outside is being totally swallowed up in compromise, in immorality, uh, in all these various evils and wickedness. Uh, and, and he says, but that will not happen here, not on my watch. So this is what a faithful ambassador says. It says here, this is an outpost for God, this one place, this one Indian reservation, for as long as I am breathing air, is not going to uh, cave in to the world and all the pressures of wickedness that come in. It's going to push back out. And that's what our mission is supposed to be. It's intriguing to me to consider that every single home school out there and every uh, house church represents an embassy. And, they, and so no matter how small it might be, they still must be a faithful ambassador for Christ.
even if it ends it up in chains. That is very, very important because the, it's a deposit that we're entrusted with. And I think this is exactly what's being described in a way in Isaiah 4, verse 5. If you remember back in the Exodus days, we talked about this before, there was one giant pillar of fire that led all of Israel through the desert, through the wilderness. And it was uh, fire at night and pillar of smoke by day. But in Isaiah 4, 5, that one pillar now becomes a multitude. Every single assembly of the households of Zion has a pillar of smoke and fire over it. It says, so God, God is present in all of these places. It, all of this is extraterritoriality. It's showing that this is a place where God and his domain is expanding, is taught, that his crown rights are being pressed. And just so you know that it's not just um, Rushduni, because people say, oh, that's Rushduni's uh, idiosyncratic interpretation about pressing crown rights. Even Barnett, he says, that the envoy comes with the authority of the sender in his place to secure his interests. In that period, to reject the representations of an envoy was to reject the one who sent him. This is what Dr. Rushdoony says. And by the way, we're on this topic of praying for the uh, civil magistrates, as you said, Andrea, in that church in San Jose. Rushdoony uh, himself, Dr. Rushdoony says, this is a very significant verse here about praying for those over you. And uh, he says, because this was considered insulting to the Roman authorities. He said, what do you mean? You're supposed to pray to Caesar, not for Caesar. And when you're praying for Caesar, you are asserting your extraterritorial nature, that the church is something beyond, if you will. It's in the midst, but yet its king is overhead in the heavens. So it's driven by a power that's not earthly anymore. And so that's a huge uh, point, that even our prayers exhibit the fact that we are ambassadors and that our king that we represent sits on a, on a heavenly throne and not an earthly throne. Kings of the earth are. And therefore, we do not pray to Caesar, we pray for Caesar. And the day will come when Christians are faithful in this, that this will also stick in the craw of the statists, because they really do want you to pray only to Caesar and to uh, drop all notions that you're anything other than an extension of the current state. Because you become stateless as far as they're concerned if you're saying, well, we assert the kingdom of God. And they said, we don't know this kingdom. There's a semi-humorous scene near the, uh, in the middle of the movie, The Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille's 1956 classic. A lot of it never happened, but it's very, very, very amusing where um, Moses and Aaron are standing in line with lots of other envoys from other nations, you know, Bithynia and uh, Sardis, Sardinia and all this. And, uh, and everyone else is arrayed like an envoy. And these two guys look like shepherds with staffs. And so finally, an, an official walks over to him and says, well, what kingdom do you represent? And Moses answers, the kingdom of the Most High. And that's kind of what we're going to be at. We're going to be standing with the staff, but asserting that we represent, represent the kingdom of the Most High and to be forthright about it, not cowardly, but standing on the promises of God. And that makes us at least the first step, being not being afraid, not being fearful, being a good ambassador. Because our job, like Rush to, uh, Mark says here, is to be faithful with the message, to convey the exact message that we received as an as a, as a entrusted deposit, a sacred deposit, and then pass it on so that the world would be reconciled to God in Christ. That's the purpose, to see that all things are of God. There's nothing outside of God. There's no discipline or area of human concern that isn't actually biblical and, not, and uh, therefore not neutral and not certainly state-controlled. And that we know no man anymore after the flesh. Our relationships are all determined by what the, God, the word of God says. And this makes for a good ambassador. And when we're effective at this, we'll know. It might not even be that we see it, but just by being effective, God promises that there's going to be healing following the fact that we're faithful ambassadors. So long as we're not faithful ambassadors and see the church as something other than an embassy, instead of a beachhead for advancing the kingdom of God, we see it as a symbol of withdrawal. Uh, then there will not be healing, and God's going to bypass us and let us die in the wilderness, as we deserve for being faithless ambassadors. You know, there are different eschatological views in the church, and some, even among the more faithful churches that are taking a stand, wouldn't have an eschatology that we necessarily would say is in line with a post-millennial thought. But I think there's a balance that we can all agree on, we as post millennials will say there's work to be done and Christ will return when we have 
spread our the message of Christ far and wide and, and more people are listening and obeying it. And yet these other folks are acting as though it could happen at any time. And so we need to be faithful. And I think there can be a real harmony of purpose. And I'm seeing in a lot of the churches that are being faithful that God is rewarding them with better theology, that their messages are actually very different when, than what their stated theology is. And they're talking about the need for Christian schools and Christian colleges. Well, if you really thought that we only had a week or so left, you wouldn't do that. Right. And that's where I think, and Mark, maybe you could talk a little bit about how if Christians regained the perspective on what their tithes were supposed to purchase, that we might see um, education being an area where we're churning out faithful ambassadors. Well, well, in terms of the tithe, in other words, a lot of people might ask the question, what can I do? I, I want to help make better ambassadors. And I think Christians have missed the opportunity with their tithe to invest in areas, like instead of thinking we're going to do it with a political party, what if you decided to get a family that needed Christian education and the parents couldn't homeschool, that people started putting their money to put these children through a Christian education? It's interesting how God returns his people to faithfulness. Good theology isn't, doesn't always come from people st- studying it systematically. Sometimes God forces his people to make a decision because of the crises that come into their life. This, the response of the church today is one of them. Going back a, a generation, much of Protestantism was a little late in reacting to Roe versus Wade. But when they did react to it, good things have come and a better understanding of an issue that was largely ignored by the church for some time. The Catholic Church was a little bit ahead, and Protestantism played a little bit of catch-up. But we have to, to realize that God moves us in a certain direction. But you're right, the tithe is absolutely necessary. The tithe is the funding mechanism, as we've often said, at Chalcedon. And if God's people refuse to fund kingdom work, they can't expect to see the kingdom growing by leaps and bounds. God is not going to reward their indolence, their their stinginess, and their theft by giving them the advantage of seeing great progress. It will wait until there's a more faithful generation down the road. So there's sometimes God forces us in a crisis to reevaluate where we are. A lot of churches who are meeting are finding that all sorts of people suddenly want to come to their church because they share a certain priority. They see this is important to, to meet as well, that the government shouldn't be telling the church what to do. And so we're seeing a lot of people get together with somewhat different theologies, but they have something very strong in common. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I'd like to point out when we talk about a good versus a bad ambassador, a faithful one versus a faithless one, that we're not left in the lurch about God's attitude about a bad messenger, about a bad envoy. It's actually laid out in Proverbs 10.26. And I think uh, this is vivid imagery, I think. As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is a sluggard to them that send him. You see, he's the guy who's being sent with the message. The, the, he's the envoy, but he's a sluggard. He's not willing to actually go through the trouble or the pain of advancing the entire message that's given to him. Therefore, because the message is garbled or is crippled or is muffled, we get what? Vinegar to the tongue, smoke in the eyes. And you see, we have to realize how important it is that we're faithful to the entire counsel of God. That's why Paul says, you know, I am guiltless of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to proclaim the whole counsel of God to you. And that's so important. As an ambassador, ambassador, he's proclaiming the whole counsel of God. And I think that is uh, what we need to be doing. And we tend to snip, snip, and pare it down and make it much easier because we are sluggards. And until that is fixed, we will fail to bear rule because it's the hand of the diligent that shall bear rule. You see a man diligent in his labors, he shall stand before kings. Well, guess who stands before kings? Ambassadors do. And we're going to fail that test if we're sluggards at it. 
You see, when Paul is being an ambassador in front of Felix, he was accused of being mad. Seems to me if you're doing your job right, that's the conclusion you might initially get. Because, <laughs> of course, you're representing an invisible God to someone who only walks by sight. But that's the calling. That's the mission. That's the message. That's the gospel. That's the God with whom we have to do. And it's also yes. the nature of the good news. So something that was um, hard for me to get when I first started reading Rush Dooney's books was when he would talk about humanism as being a competing religion. And that was hard for a lot of people because people looked at state schools and state institutions, higher education as somehow being neutral. But more and more people are getting it now. And when you say things like that's just another religious belief, they understand um, I've heard people say, we're at war with this. Now, the weapons of our war warfare are not get out your machine gun, get the tank, get the grenades. It's by using what we have in God's word and where we educate and, you know, speak to our enemies. That's why I think I'm getting a much better understanding of rather than hating the people who oppress Christians, recognize the, the amazing power we have to bring our petitions to God to see present-day Saul's turned into Paul's. That's the beauty of it, right? The message there that he's, when he says we're ambassadors, he concludes that verse with be reconciled to God. That's the message. The dynamics of it are the three preceding things. And by the way, it's intensely personal there because we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about God, we're talking about the world, the people in the world, and we're talking about relationship to be reconciled because there's a breach. And so we're going in there and saying, we want to be repairs of the breach, Isaiah 58, 12. There shall be a thee, shall repair, uh, build the old waste places, I shall be called the repair of the breach, the restore of the past to dwell in, etc. Raising up the foundations of many generations is the middle clause. There's a lot of work to be done, uh, but we as ambassadors are called to use those weapons. And so we conquer, if you will, by converting enemies, not into corpses, but into friends. And that's how the kingdom of God advances by and large. And, uh, and we're not to advance it by the sword, but by the spirit. Right. Mark, what do you think your dad would say living today? I mean, he's been gone now for 20 years, but when you read his books and you read his position papers, especially, you'd think that he had just tuned into the latest, you know, piece of media. You think he'd be encouraged? You think he would see things as the hopeful thing that persecution and oppression brings about? Well, he was certainly ahead of the curve on understanding our times in terms of the, the crisis that we're closer to now by 20 years. So I don't think he would be surprised at much of what he sees but I think he would be, in fact, I think he would be somewhat heartened because even though the resistance to these trends seems to be decentralized, in fact, a lot of the ideas that he propagated and that he taught are now widely held. They are widely believed, even by people who don't even know the name Rushduni. They're becoming more mainstream, at least in the Christian churches. And crises force you to realize things. When, he, when you predict a crisis, you are seen as, well, that's odd. We're going to put you over here because I don't see a crisis, and therefore we're going to ignore you and we're going to marginalize you. When the crisis comes, as he predicted, and it becomes more intensified, and it begins to affect you and your church, then there's a tendency for more and more people to, to start following what he was saying. And I think they are directly or indirectly, and that's a good thing. And even in his lifetime, people were afraid of him. They were, didn't want to be associated with the name, so they would often paraphrase his ideas and use them. Sometimes he was a little put out, but on the whole, he said, at least they're on the right track, he believed. And so I think he would be gratified that the ideas are growing, even as, as things in our culture are, become, are coming to a head and are, are, are looking pretty ugly right now. I think we should always point out 
as bad as things are, there is an avenue that's forward. This may not be the easy way out, as your father would say, Mark, but there is a way out. That's why there's some hope expressed in this verse in Proverbs 13, 17, about the good versus the bad ambassador. He says the good one, as Walkie uh, renders it, a faithful envoy is one who brings healing, healing to the community. So if we're good ambassadors, we'll see our communities healed. If our communities are on the are rotting away, moral decay into political decay, it's because we're bad ambassadors and we need to have that. That's laid at the foot of the church as an embassy that's faithless. And is not only faithless, but lazy, a sluggard. We can rectify this. There's something that we can do. I'm better ambassadors, more faithful with the message and with the whole message, not just snipping away at it and rewriting our marching orders. We have the whole world to reconcile, and that's a big project, but it can be done. In the meantime, we face the kind of situation where our indolence has wrought ruin, and Dr. Rushdie was one of the first ones to identify this clearly because he has had a good moral sense of where we're going. He says, if you go down this path, this is going to be the inevitable result of it. But if you go down this other path that God's pointing you to, things are going to take a very different turn. So it's not that things are uh, neutrally going on their own way. Our actions as ambassadors drive them one way or the other. And I think this is where the whole idea of every area of life and thought falls under the dominion of Jesus Christ. That means that the average person who is in business, in politics, in education, in any sort of aspect of the community can basically educate two or three other people, have it be very decentralized. One of my greatest joys are women who have gone through the biblical law class who start classes with young people or other women of their church. I just heard from one woman who said it was a three and a half year journey, but I took 10 women through the Institutes of Biblical Law. That's how we're going to multiply and I can see why, quite frankly, the enemy doesn't want Christians meeting. Because when Christians are in community and they pray together, Jesus is present. That's what he promised. So it's actually a good strategy to make sure we're not meeting. It's a better strategy in terms of the kingdom of God to say, I don't think so. They know, our enemies know, that a threefold cord is not easily broken. So they can't allow anything more than a single line cord. You know, there's a... Uh... We're familiar with the phrase, Jesus is Lord. It's it's in Philippians. It was one of the first uh, confessions of faith, Jesus is Lord. And I can remember over 40 years ago, Greg Bonson, who didn't have much use for religious bumper stickers, he said, Jesus is Lord is one bumper sticker I won't object to. I can live with that one, certainly. But when the, the first Christians confessed that, it was considered treasonable because we say it just has a beautiful ring to it and, and we believe that Jesus is our spiritual Lord. But to the Roman world, it meant, you mean Caesar is not? In fact, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you'll see that very often when people were sent to their death, uh, as Christians, and be, for being Christians, they were offered an out, and the out often was as simple as saying, say Caesar is Lord, and you can go. And sometimes family members would even beg them, just say it. And they went to their death saying, Jesus is Lord. And that means he's Lord of a kingdom. Lord is not just a nice, nice spiritual term, it means he has authority, and he has authority over us, and therefore we speak with authority because we speak as ambassadors of our Lord Jesus. And I think the phrase or the passage that says, if God be for us, who can be against us, emboldens the Christian and emboldens us as ambassadors. Whether we're talking to the grocery clerk, the mailman, the census worker, the person who's, you know, our, our doctor or someone who's telling us we need to have a certain medical procedure, vaccination or whatever, we need to be standing on the rock and the better prepared we are, which of course means understanding the law and putting it into practice, the better ambassador we're going to be. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, any closing thoughts before we finish tonight? 
I think it's, uh, again, winding around the importance and the relationship of a faithful ambassador to the health of a community, of a culture, of a society. That word health is repeated again in Proverbs 4.22, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. That word health as appears there as Solomon lays it out. And then in Proverbs 12.18, there is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. That same word is used about the faithful envoy, the faithful ambassador. It's a concept that's from beginning to end of scripture. And when scripture talks about health, it's the whole man not just the physical body, but the spirit, but even the society sees that healing. In uh, Malachi 4.2, we read about the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. That word healing takes us back to the healing that is brought by the ambassadors. So as the son of righteousness is rising, we are part of the agency by which healing is dealt with. So we have an important function as embassies, as ambassadors. It's not just to sip wine with other diplomats. It's to help heal this very broken world. I think we should let Martin's words close us then. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Chalcedon Podcast. To learn more about the ministry of Chalcedon or to discover thousands of great Christian books, sermons, lectures, videos, newsletters, and more, just visit chalcedon.edu today.